Okay. So this uh, first uh, technical session is on air pollutant sources and uh, overview of the air pollutants themselves. <clears throat> on your agenda, you have the five workshop objectives, and this next hour, we'll, I'll be uh, working on two of those objectives, the top two. First of all, increasing understanding of the sources of air pollution, and then also throughout the uh, lecture, I'll be providing information on where you can get further resources, both about air pollutants and their sources, because there's a lot of information you'll be uh, getting this week, and we don't expect you'll memorize all of it. So it's really important to get these, um, to know where to find resources when you go back and are working on your uh, media stories. Okay. Now onto the technical subject matter. If we think about air pollution broadly, there are two categories of air pollutants. Uh, the the first one that I'll talk about is the one that we uh, hear about most, I think, or we learn about it in our, in our textbooks in high school and in college, and these are the gas phase molecules. So at the top here, I have the four uh, main greenhouse gases. These are the ones that are responsible for most of the warming of the atmosphere. There's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. And then, apart from these greenhouse gases that do the warming of the atmosphere, you have a number of uh, molecules which have various harms when inhaled uh, at, the, at the Earth's surface. So, for example, ozone causes a respiratory ailment. Um, sulfur dioxide is... Um, uh, it, it, it also actually causes uh, respiratory and um, eye irritation. Carbon monoxide, if you ever have uh, written a story or read a story about smoke inhalation, somebody dying from smoke inhalation, that's due to the high levels of carbon monoxide that's um, emitted with, along with the smoke. Um, benzene is one of the carcinogenic uh, organic compounds that has a, actually a very nice aroma. If you ever are sitting in a traffic intersection behind an idling motorcycle, that um, fragrant pollutant that you're smelling is probably benzene, which is among a class of volatile organic compounds. Uh, oxides of nitrogen are responsible for some of the brown uh, haze that we have in the atmosphere. And um, see, ammonia gets... Um, combines with another pollutant, nitric acid, to form uh, particulate matter. So these are all various air pollutants, and uh, we'll be talking about them a little bit in more detail as we go along and talk about sources of them. Um, so I mentioned that there are two broad categories of air pollutants, one of them being gases. Can anybody tell me what the other category of air pollutants is? Particulate matter. Excellent. Particulate matter or some, uh, abbreviated PM, is, uh, are very, very small particles, liquid or solid, or combinations of liquid and solid that are suspended in the atmosphere. To give you an idea of how small they are, this is a blown up diagram of a human hair, and most of the particulate matter we're concerned about is, has a diameter of one micrometer, one millionth of a meter, and that corresponds to about 50 of these particles could move could be spread across the diameter of a human hair. The reason we're concerned about particulate matter is that it's now uh, the, the main pollutant that's causing premature deaths worldwide. Uh, about 7 million people are estimated to die earlier than expected due to inhalation of particulate matter. It's also the reason why um, the sky usually appears white instead of blue in uh, our cities in the HKH region. Um, in addition, it has a major role in affecting the Earth's radiative balance. So some of the particulate matter scatters light back to outer space that should have reached the surface. Some particulate matter absorbs light and causes warming of the atmosphere. These particulate uh, matter also interact with the clouds and um, cause those clouds to rain out um, 
less frequently and sometimes more heavily. So it affects the cloud properties and the monsoon. The particles contain a lot of other components inside them. That'll be the next slide. But the, broadly speaking, the way these particles are different from gases is most of the gases are totally invisible, right? We have oxygen and nitrogen in this room. It's making up 95% or more of the air that we're breathing, but we can't see that. But the particles, actually, we can see. Uh, there are tens of thousands of particles, fine particles, in every cubic centimeter of the air in this room. And outside, it might be even more. And the way that we see them is we can't see these individual particles because they're too small. There's one micron in diameter is too small for the naked eye to see. But because there are millions or billions or trillions of these particles out in the atmosphere, uh, and we, when we look through the atmosphere, try to look at the horizon, we see that the horizon is white, and that's actually all the particulate matter that we're seeing in the, in the air. So the main difference, I'd say, between gases and particles is that you can see the particles. But the other reasons are mentioned here, the, the cause of uh, premature mortality and heart attacks and um, some other radiative effects. Particulate matter, because of the numerous effects that it has, is right now, I think, our top priority air pollutant. In the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, uh, those policymakers, who is one of our target audiences, that are responsible for managing the air quality, should focus on reducing particulate matter, fine particulate matter, substantially, without, without making substantial increases in other pollutants. Okay? So there are many air pollutants, but I'm saying that particulate matter is the one to focus on primarily. And the reason for that is, if we take aggressive controls of reducing the fine particles, that will bring down the concentrations of many of the other pollutants in, in, this, in the same process. For example, if we have more reliance on renewable energy, let's say um, solar-powered lighting instead of uh, kerosene lamps, that will bring down not only the fine particulate matter, but also the carbon monoxide, various volatile organic compounds. Air pollutant concentrations. This is one such, which is a five-year average of surface level particulate matter in all the land covered regions of the world. And uh, the concentrations of particles are given in units of micrograms per cubic meter. And this afternoon you'll be measuring these concentrations with the instruments on the bus ride to Nagarkot. What does that mean? Micrograms is the weight of the particles or their mass. So we measure them in millionths of a gram. That's how small and light they are. And per cubic meter of air that these particles are suspended in. So the World Health Organization has a guideline for these fine particles. It says that above 10 micrograms per cubic meter, if we breathe on an at, um, every day for a full year, that's unhealthy for us. And if you look at the color shading, let's just focus maybe on the yellow, orange, and red portions of this diagram. You can see that values above 40 micrograms per cubic meter are widespread across eastern China, uh, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, or northern South Asia, as well as other regions of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. So these places are at least four times more polluted than what the World Health Organization considers to be uh, healthy air. You can see, if you look at this map very carefully, you would be hard-pressed to tell me where the Beijing or Shanghai metropolitan area is, or Delhi, right? It's just, it's a blanket of red. But let's go ahead and look at the concentrations of these fine particles within the cities. This is a chart that I took directly from the WHO Ambient Air Quality Database, which is a database of 1,600 metropolitan areas where the particle pollution was measured for at least a year. And, it's, and the red bar in these chart, sorry, the red bars in this chart represents the concentration of the fine particles on an annual average basis. And in the cities where air pollution has been studied for a long time and uh, regulations have been in effect for a long time, like London and Los Angeles, we see that the concentrations are 20 or less. But in the last decade or so, these 
particulate matter had been measured in more and more places across the world. And now what we have is a more complete picture of particulate matter pollution throughout the world. And we see that the concentrations that we were focused on in the North America and Western Europe are dwarfed by the concentrations in um, South Asia and East Asia. In this uh, uh, in the World Health Organization chart, they classified each region into subregions, and they labeled it for some reason as Southeast Asia. But don't be misled by that. Uh, we'll just focus on the cities and the concentrations. I'll, uh, now, this is a very full slide, so I'll reduce it down to the PM 2.5 in our HKH cities. So at the top of the list is Delhi, with a concentration of 153 micrograms per cubic meter for fine particulate matter. So this, this is saying that the air in Delhi is 15 times more concentrated in particles than what, we, what the WHO considers to be unhealthy air. Um, followed closely behind Delhi are Patna and Gwalior. They're not shown on this chart because we just focused on cities that are, um, well, we had to fit all of them, first of all. Karachi is uh, number five in the world, followed closely by Peshawar and Rawalpindi. Um, eight more cities, not shown here, are in the top 20, and those are all in North India. So that means 11 out of the top 20 cities in, um, in terms of fine particulate air pollution are in North India. Kabul ranks just ahead of Dhaka here with a concentration of somewhere between 85 and 90 micrograms per cubic meter. The highest, uh, most polluted city in this database in China was, in, was Lanzhou. Um, which also is in the greater HKH region. Um, Kathmandu, based on some old data, ranked 108th with a concentration of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Mandalay was the most polluted city in uh, Myanmar on this list at 30 micrograms per cubic meter. And then Timpu uh, in Bhutan was actually meeting the World Health Organization uh, guideline with just under 10 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, in 2011, when this was, when the measurements were collected. So very, very high levels of particulate air pollution in the cities, as well as across broad regions of this part of the world. Um, as we said earlier, PM 2.5 is composed of many, many different um, chemical components. So there are thousands of different organic compounds inside the particulate matter. If you see somebody uh, smoking cigarettes, you, then the smoke coming out of the cigarette is particulate matter. And within that are some carcinogenic compounds uh, like benzoapyrene and other polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are all in that fine particulate matter. There are also um, some inorganic ions like sulfate and nitrate. And these are usually in the aqueous portion of the particles. So as I said, these particles aren't solid. They are often a mixture of solid and liquid, and, um, and even water is present in the particles. So on a very humid day, you might see the particles, um, you might see more of these particles just because more water is being absorbed onto their surface from the gas. And in very extreme circumstances, you'll get fog formation, like... Um, in the Indo-Gangetic plane we have often in the wintertime. So fog forms onto the, onto the uh, seeds that are formed by these fine particles. Black carbon is one of the pollutants that we are, or one of the components of fine particles that we he talk about a lot and hear about in the news. And that's because, number one, it absorbs radiation very, um, very efficiently. So it contributes to warming of the atmosphere, just like carbon dioxide. And number two, black carbon is a carcinogen. Uh, it's been shown, at, if breathed even at very low levels, two or three micrograms per cubic meter, it can cause cancer over uh, the time period of human life. And then there's also a number of trace elements in these particles. Um, if, especially if you're near a m big industrial manufacturing plant, you might have emissions of things like cadmium and cerium and arsenic, and those would all be inside of the particulate matter. 
Oftentimes, I read in um, the newspaper, black carbon being referred to as a different pollutant than PM2.5. But it's not. It is one component of the PM2.5 mixture. And it's usually a very small component, maybe 5 to 10% of the PM2.5 mass is black carbon. Sulfate, similarly, it's part of the PM2.5 mixture. It happens to be one component of the fine particles that scatters radiation, whereas black carbon absorbs radiation. But both of them are components of this broader uh, category of pollution that we are concerned about called PM2.5. There's also a lot of complicated chemistry that occurs that uh, between the, gas, the surrounding gas molecules and the fine particles themselves. We won't go into this in a lot of detail, but I believe uh, you will be measuring volatile organic compounds today afternoon with one of the instruments. And just know that some of those volatile organic compounds can ha undergo chemical reaction in the atmosphere and then um, condense onto the particles so they can add to the fine particulate matter. The sulfur dioxide, which is highly emitted from brick kilns, brick factories that you'll visit tomorrow, also undergoes some chemical reaction to form sulfuric acid, and then that too condenses onto the particles to form more PM2.5. If you were to go on Google and type in overview of air pollutants, you would get, at least I did, 53 million results, and it contains a variety of information about air pollutants. Some of it's too simplistic, some of it's far too complex. Um, a lot of it actually is conflicting information, as I, saw, as I found. The important thing about this uh, webpage is uh, it's ru updated routinely, and the underlying content is constantly being updated to reflect the latest scientific knowledge. So if you go here, you can be assured that you're getting the latest uh, scientific knowledge about the air pollutant of interest. And um, if you click here, the EPA particle pollution site, you'll get a page that looks like this. It gives you some very uh, basic information about particles. And, like, and analogously, you can find a page like this for all the other air pollutants. So very good um, resource for you all to get information about air pollutants is, is epa.gov. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, excellent. Uh, the question was, is it more important to consider the size of the particulate matter or the constituents? And another question coming here. Your particular matter, yes, you, 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 how can you um, separate the differences between particulate matter and gases? Okay. okay, all right. So let me take the first question and then the second one, difference between particles and gases. So in terms of the particulate matter size, they range over uh, a range of 10,000, like so from one nanometer particles all the way to 100 micro. 100 micrometer particles. Those are all in the atmosphere. It turns out that any particle that's more than uh, 10 micrometers in diameter, it, it won't even uh, make it down into our lungs. It's typically filtered out by the hairs in our nostrils, right? And even if you breathe through your mouth, it's filtered out by the lining of your throat. Particles that are smaller than two and a half microns make it past the nasal region, past the uh, throat, and in, deep into the lungs. And so, uh, for, as a first cut, we're most concerned about the finer particles because those are the ones that can get embedded in our lungs and cause inflammation, cause hardening of the arteries, and leading to uh, heart attacks and strokes. And this is the way that about 80% of the deaths caused by particulate matter are from um, heart attacks and strokes. Now, in some cases, that particulate matter may have some highly toxic component in it, like... Um, cadmium or lead. And so in those cases, if that lead or cadmium is within fine particulate matter, then it can have an even uh, more ag aggressive effect on our body. So for example, lead was removed from gas gasoline or petrol in most of the world over the last 30 years. And that's because it was found to cause um, 
acute uh, brain damage. So there's a, a case where the composition also matters. So it's not just size or just composition, but both. And now onto the second question about what's the difference between these gases and the particles. The main difference to keep it at a very broad level is the gases, they are invisible to the naked eye and the particles are the ones that cause this reduction in visibility. Uh, isn't it possible just if we have some PM 2.5 in a particular region, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to trace the source both in terms of geographic location of the source also? What people have done is they've measured the chemical composition of the particles from different sources, like go to a brick kiln, measure the smoke coming out of that, go to a cooking stove, burning dung, measure the pollution coming out of that. And then if you measure enough of the chemical compounds, especially the organic compounds, because there are thousands of them, as well as the trace elements, you can get a chemical fingerprint for that source. And then if you do that for many sources, let's say a dozen, two dozen sources, then you have chemical fingerprints for all the different major sources. And then you can, people have done this, where they go and they measure the chemical composition out somewhere in the atmosphere, let's say at an air pollution observatory on the mountaintop. And then there's some small calculation that has to be done to find out what's the best linear combination of these chemical fingerprints that will add up to give me the composition of the pollution in the atmosphere. And by this method, you can say, oh, okay, 20% of my particulate matter came from brick kilns and 15% came from uh, motorcycles and 12% from uh, cooking stoves and so forth. So that can be done by the chemical tagging. What this chemical composition cannot tell you is geographically where did that pollution come from because the wood burned in a cooking stove in Nepal may not differ very much from that burned in in India. Its chemical composition is very, very similar. And so for that, the only way that we have right now to, um, to estimate how much pollution comes from different countries is by doing some mathematical modeling, tracking the pollution from its source all the way to uh, the destination, as well as we can look at backward wind trajectories. We can integrate the wind fields backward in time and say, okay, this air parcel that I uh, experienced here in Kathmandu, it had its origin somewhere in eastern, or sorry, western Nepal. I want to ask a question on that. Okay. Um, and uh, the other question, I think. Yeah. Uh, which part, which components is most visible, or the degree of different visibility? Of okay. Yeah. yeah. So the particles that are most visible are those which have a size that's close to the to the wavelength of visible light, which is between. 300 and 700 nanometers, or 0.3 to 0.7 microns. Those scatter light the most, most efficiently. Of all the pollutants that we've talked about today, PM 2.5 is the one that is most visible. And then among the gases, nitrogen dioxide is the most visible of the gaseous pollutants. It's the one that makes the air a little bit brownish. So fine particulate matter dominates the visibility uh, degradation. 95% of all the visibility impairment is from PM 2.5, and maybe 5% or less from nitrogen dioxide. Um, where would you categorize dust in this mix? So most of the dust that's emitted from, let's say, uh, roadway traffic is <clears throat> larger than 2.5 microns. It's in the coarse particulate fraction. About 5 to 10% of the dust that's emitted may be in the fine particulate fraction, and then it would be categorized in this other area because it's mainly made out of trace elements like aluminosilicates, aluminum, silicon, oxygen. And uh, it, it wouldn't categorize in organic or black carbon or, or in ions. Calcium carbonate's also sometimes, in some places, a big fraction of the dust. The next part of the presentation actually was on sources of air pollutants. So one of the, I think, Everybody here is familiar with the indoor sources of air pollution, um, cooking with biofuels and air conditioners and so forth. Um, incense burning, mosquito coils. The lesser known sources I'll go through briefly. Um, irrigation pumps, uh, it turns out there's about 
we estimate something like 10 million of these diesel-powered irrigation pumps across the Indo-Gangetic Plain, and each of them consume about 100 liters of diesel per year. So there's a billion liters of diesel fuel being used to pump water out of the, from the groundwater and then used to irrigate farms. So that's a big source of black carbon and um, carbon monoxide as well and nitrogen oxides. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Fuel evaporation is one that many people uh, aren't maybe less familiar with. So when you actually, when you put fuel into your car tank or your motorcycle tank, um, before you put fuel inside, the tank is mostly empty. There's a little bit of liquid at the bottom, but there's a lot of gas vapors that are in the rest of the tank. And when you refuel the tank, those gases get displaced out of the, out of the, um, out of the tank. And that's all made up of uh, volatile organic compounds. These are highly carcinogenic compounds. It's a big, huge source of VOCs uh, in urban areas. Livestock emits methane, emits uh, nitrogen, I'm sorry, emits ammonia from the, from the urine and the feces. Landfills also are a big source of methane and a potential mitigation opportunity because that methane can be turned into energy. Um, fertilizers are uh, a big source of ammonia, uh, ammonia gas, which then later forms the fine particulate matter. And then after you've painted your home, you probably have that familiar smell that comes off of it. That's also volatile organic compounds as well as any other solvents that we put for cleaning and coating. Maintaining and building inventories is a really important step to air quality management. If we don't know what the main sources are, we can't control the problem. We'll just be relying on people's gut instinct, uh, which, as I mentioned before, we found to be usually wrong. So until government-level inventories are prepared, the best information source for you all to know what are the sources of pollutants in your given country is to look at the academic literature. And so in the handout that you'll get, I've provided a couple of papers which have detailed emission inventories for, in this case, all of the countries in Asia. So with data in this, these articles, you can actually find out um, source contributions uh, to any major pollutant, not just black carbon, as I've shown here, but also within each of the Indian states, they've subdivided it by state, and they go from 1990, I believe, all the way to 2015. So you can get a good amount of information from these um, academic sources. It would be much easier if it was on a government website and um, you could get the information directly, but that's not the case yet in the HKH region. So there's... A lot of information, I think, in such graphs and that you could use for your own uh, projects. If you want, let's say you're doing a story on brick kilns and you want to know how much do the brick kilns emit relative to the other sources, information in an emission inventory would be the place to go to get that, to get that kind of data. Uh, what I've shown you today are, in my opinion, as a scientist, having knowledge of this field for over 20 years, are the most reputed sources of information that you can get on air pollutants and their sources. Um, I, oftentimes, people with much less knowledge will give you a very different opinion, and I would, say, I, would, I would submit to you that those opinions are much more politically motivated than the one that I've provided today. Um, emission inventories, I think, are the least, the, the most transparent, unbiased sources of information that you can get on relative contributions of different sources to different pollutants. Thank you. Okay, uh, you just said that you shouldn't uh, 